The exhibition is called Periodic Tales, and it's very loosely based on a book I wrote of the same title, a kind of cultural history of the chemical elements. The elements are all around us, and they belong to all of us, and they're not something you only stumble on if you happen to wander into a chemistry laboratory. We don't often get a chance to look at great chunks of this element or that element. So what the artists have done is they've reclaimed these elements from the chemistry prep run and put them out in the world in great big, bright, colourful lumps for us to look at. We've tried to pick works where we can see the actual material there in a way that tells you something about the meaning of that element and how it belongs in our culture. Simon Patterson has taken the periodic table and so instead of the name of each element uh, in the box along with its proper symbol, his mind has raced away and he's produced some strange association with some celebrity or historical figure from elsewhere and link those to the chemical symbols. You could spend a long time looking at this work and puzzling over how Simon Patterson's mind has worked. We put this work at the beginning of the show to indicate to visitors that we're not going to be playing by the usual chemist's rules and that elements may produce unexpected associations. The periodic table is a little bit like having a deck of cards and the idea that you can choose different elements and you can deal out cards from that deck, right, and tell stories with them to illustrate what is one of the foundation stones, not just of chemistry, but actually of our culture, of our civilization. Silver is one of the ancient elements, and so a work like Cornelia Parker's called 30 Pieces of Silver takes silver tableware and flattens it, perhaps makes some sort of comment on changing class systems. 30 Pieces of Silver is linked to the Bible and religion and betrayal. But then on a more domestic level, we're more interested in the silver as a signifier of wealth. So in my little pools of 30 Pieces of Silver, I wanted, you know, teapots and toast racks and trophies. And then you flatten them, you've undermined their grandeur. You know, they've been knocked off their pedestal, as it were. Then it goes back to this betrayal. So these pieces of silver have been betrayed. Silver is probably the most consistent material I've worked in. It's got metaphoric associations. So the thunder is a tarnish that's accumulated on famous people's objects. So Samuel Colt's soup tureen, you know, which I polished in Connecticut. Dickens's spoon, which I polished in the Dickens Museum. The idea of collecting their tarnish and even their reputations restored <laughs> seemed to be a, an interesting thing. And there you take away the surface layer of the object, which is dark and black and not wanted, the patina. All the chemical elements are on this cultural journey. Potentially other ones can come to mean something to us as well. So we have some newer elements that have been discovered in modern times by modern science. Aluminium, uranium and neon. This is an extrusion piece by Heatherwick Studio and uh, Heatherwick has taken aluminium and shoved it through a, a kind of guide that pushes out a great length of it with a constant cross-section. What he's actually done is to keep the bits where you sort of tear it off at the end and the work process stops. And I think this looks rather like one of Roy Lichtenstein's brushstroke paintings. These newer elements have become culturally assimilated very quickly. So uranium is now the element we associate with nuclear power and nuclear weapons, of course. So the artist Kate Williams uses uranium glass, but what she's done is cast models of nuclear power stations that have this glow that is unique to uranium. We wanted to create monuments to the moment that they were revered because they're going to be gone soon and the embarrassment steps under the carpet. It makes people question what actually is the issue with nuclear power. And also it's around us all the time, you know, you know luminous paints, radiotherapy, and actually the sun. So nothing exists on this planet without it. 
So it's that kind of ambiguous relationship that we have with the radiation. We have an eerie feeling about them. Neon was discovered only at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. The name is chosen because it means new. Something common in the universe but rare on Earth. It doesn't specify what that something is. And it leaves space for you as a reader or as a viewer. Small bits of language, uh, fragments, phrases, sentences, half sentences, can conjure an idea or an image it's parallel to what people have been trying to do with advertising and which they've done with neon. It's glass tube and little electrical elements. It's like there's nothing there and then there is something there agitated by the electricity and it takes on this kind of glorious glowing sort of form. So there's something sort of transforming about it. Carbon is another one of the elements known since antiquity. We know it in several forms as charcoal, burnt wood, as coal, wood that's preserved underground, also as graphite and more rarely as diamond. And the work behind me here by Lucy Scare is called Black Alphabet after Brancusi and the forms are made of coal dust impregnated with resin to form a solid shape. There are 26 pieces and that references obviously the letters of the alphabet and is a reminder that we've always used black for mark making and we still use black in our computer printers and pens and pencils today. Work by David Nash that accompanies it has the basic sort of geometries of drawing a square form, a circular form, and a triangular form, all executed in charcoal. And that reminds us that all drawing and design comes out of black on white and charcoal originally as well. I think it's very important to close the gap between science and art because there shouldn't be a gap because we really are very similar. We're testing materials, we're seeing what they can do, what their properties are. Inhale cliffs, you know, the idea of calcium impregnates your bed sheets and starching them with chalk from the White Cliffs of Dover, so that you're sleeping between two cliffs. I like the idea of that. <laughs> you associate the White Cliffs of Dover with jingoism and being patriotic, so the idea of almost like a nationalist pride gone mad <laughs> um, and how uncomfortable that might be to sleep in between those two sheets. It's curious how those expanded materials turn into cultural icons, turn into artworks. That's where my interests are. It all springs from the elements themselves and their materiality. And it just so happens that artists are working with many of the chemical elements and using them in some ways as a chemist would, reacting with them and reacting off them to produce amazingly visual results. It's very important to be able to compare and contrast a, in a sense, rigidly scientific way, uh, the, the, the way to organize the elements with something perhaps more whimsical, something more cultural, which actually helps us, in a sense, to understand the richness of what the periodic table really represents for us in, in everyday life. The hidden riches and byways of the chemical world. What I hope is that this exhibition will give visitors the sense of having been able to trespass into a chemistry lab, one they perhaps left unhappily many years ago at school when that periodic table hung on the wall, and actually to see in a rather different way some of the materiality and the colours and the weight and so on of many of the elements.